Okay, let's talk thermal physics. Um, thermal physics is the study of temperature, heat, and how these things affect matter, and how they move from one place to another. Um, and there's some important things to, to pay attention to. Most people confuse the idea of temperature and heat. We're going to add to that the idea of internal energy. Um, all kinds of cool stuff. There's a lot going on here, and we have an unfortunately short time to do it. So let's see what we can get, get done here. Um, so temperature, heat, and internal energy are words that we're going to use that are not synonymous. They do not mean the same thing, and it's important that we distinguish them. They are um, physically different quantities, they have different units, and they represent different things, though they're all tied together. So heat is something that causes a change in internal energy, and then internal energy um, causes a change in temperature. Um, or, or internal energy, is, a change in internal energy is apparent to us um, through a change in temperature. A change in temperature is one way of measuring some of the internal energy. So let's start with heat. Heat is the basis of what we're going on here. Um, heat is energy. Heat is measured in energy and has units of joules um, or whatever um, energy units you want to use. So you have this process where objects exchange heat. Energy moves from one object to another. This only happens if there is a temperature difference between those two objects. So if I put two objects together and they're at the same temperature, no heat will move from one to the other. But temperature itself doesn't move. Objects have temperature, but temperature doesn't move. Um, heat moves. Um, and in fact, heat only exists while it is moving. An object doesn't have heat. Um, heat is heat is the movement of thermal energy from one object to another. Objects have internal energy, objects exchange heat, and objects have temperature. So objects are in thermal contact when this heat energy can be exchanged between them. Usually this involves just putting the two objects in contact with each other, though there might be other interesting ways to do that. Um, you can submerge an object in a fluid, we'll put them in thermal contact. Um, yeah, it's obviously that's still touching of sorts. Um, I can't think of any uh, any any other way of doing it at this point, actually. Um, so thermal equilibrium exists when um, you put two objects together. They exchange heat. They come into thermal equilibrium when they no longer exchange heat between um, one or the other, and this happens when they reach the same temperature. So the zeroth law of thermodynamics. In general, there are going to be three laws of thermodynamics. This one came in late, um, and it was sort of an assumption from the beginning. So it's not really a law of thermodynamics, but it's a, but like here's something important to know, and we'll call it the zeroth law of thermodynamics. A little bizarre. Objects A and B are separated, um, or are separately, sorry, in thermal equilibrium with a third object C then they are also in thermal equilibrium with each other. So object C in this picture is the thermometer. When you measure the, the temperature of one, it's 225. You measure the temperature of, sorry, you measure the temperature of A, it's 225. You measure the temperature of B, it's 225. They must be at the same temperature, therefore they're in thermal equilibrium with each other. When you put A and B together, no heat will pass from one object to the other. So object C could be a thermometer, and that's uh, one of the things that we do. It's how we measure temperature, and by measuring temperature, we can tell that two things are in thermal equilibrium, even if they're not touching. Right? So we're going to define temperature because of this zeroth law. It allows us to um, create a scale. So they're in thermal equilibrium, if and only if they're at the same temperature. No heat will pass between them. So we define a Celsius scale, which is the SI scale. Americans are the last people on the, just about on the planet using this Fahrenheit bizarreness. Um, so you may have to get used to Celsius if, if you are not already. So we define water and ice when they are together, a glass of ice water. Um, when the ice and water are in thermal equilibrium and they reach that fairly quickly, they're at zero degrees Celsius. This is the freezing point of water, the temperature at which water freezes. Um, it is also the temperature at which water melts, if you're going the other way. 
Um, and then you put water and steam together in a container. Um, we're going to find that to be 100 degrees Celsius. And then so we, we have the thermometer there at zero. We make a little mark, put it in um, steam and water, make a little mark. And then we divide that up into 100 different um, points. So the 100 degrees is defined as the boiling point of water. It's also the condensation point if you're coming down. The two things happen at the same temperature. So that's our Celsius scale, defined, enti defined entirely on water changing its phase. Now this happens at different pressures in different situations, but this is at normal atmospheric pressure, you know, 1 times 10 to the 5 pascals. Um, we also define something called the Kelvin scale, which is the absolute temperature scale. It turns out um, when the pressure of a gas goes to zero, its temperature, no matter what the gas is, all goes to this um, minus, there should be a minus there, um, it, is, it just didn't quite go down the next line, minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. We call this temperature absolute zero. It becomes the zero on the Kelvin scale. And then we just give the Kelvin scale the same um, sized uh, increments as the Celsius scale. So one de plus delta one degree Celsius and delta one degree Kelvin are the same change in temperature. We just give them a different zero point. Absolute zero is effectively the coldest that anything can get. In fact, nothing can really actually physically get down to that scale or that temperature for quantum mechanics reasons. Um, but it's still a very um, useful thing to define. And we get very close to it. We get very close. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. Many zeros um, close to it. <clears throat> so we do pretty well. So minus 273.15 degrees Celsius is 0 Kelvin. Um, if you want to convert, you can just, uh, if you want to find the temperature in Celsius, just take the temperature in Kelvin and divide that 273 point, or minus, subtract, that 273.15. Um, and the degree size is the same, as I said. So what happens is, if you look at the pressure and temperature of various gases, they all create a, a sloped line. Whatever gas it is, maybe one's hydrogen, the other's helium, nitrogen, oxygen, a mix of gases, it doesn't seem to matter. Um, you, act, you know, when this was first done, the people couldn't actually get things that cold, but they'd, you know, measure some temperatures and some pressures for these gases, <clears throat> and they would um, discover that if you drew a dotted line backwards, there was this point where they all met. So long before we could reach it, we knew that there was this point that we couldn't get any, any colder than. Um, and we call that absolute zero. So the Fahrenheit scale is more um, popular in the U.S. And for those of you not used to it, it will be frustratingly annoying. Uh, because it's not terribly sensible. The freezing point is 32 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And the boiling point of water, specifically, is 212 degrees. Um, and there are 180 divisions between them nonsense but that's what it is so we often have to convert between the three different scales though you will find on the AP test they will not mention Fahrenheit they really shouldn't this is a practical thing for hanging out in the US so all of these three guys are all at the same temperature um, but they have different measurements like the the mercury in here doesn't know anything about what you've marked on the glass um, so they all have the same they're all in thermal equilibrium with each other and so they all have the, the same size. The liquid is at the same volume. Um, but they have different temperatures written on the side of the glass. So it's a very arbitrary thing. The fact that we chose water is arbitrary. We could have chosen anything to boil <coughs> or even not a boiling point, right? The only number there, <coughs> the only thing that isn't arbitrary is zero Kelvin. Um, but the, the units that you use for the Kelvin scale are just as arbitrary as anything else. <coughs> Excuse me, I forgot my drink today. <clears throat> um, so here are, I just did some algebra for you, okay? Um, converted between the two different scales. So whatever you want, you can get to the other guy. Uh, notice that last one is a delta, the change in temperature in Fahrenheit compared to the change in temperature in Celsius. That nine-fifths and five-ninths is a little tough to remember sometimes. Um, and this one here, I didn't even do that one. You could just add 273.15 to the other side if you want to make the other conversion. 
easy enough. Um, uh, don't memorize it, but use it uh, a few times and it, you'll probably stick. Keep it in your notebook. Okay. <clears throat> so it turns out when objects change their temperature, they often change their size, especially certain solids. Well, actually, um, solids, liquids, and gases, I'll do that, but it's um, a little easier to measure, I guess, with a solid. Um, so what happens is molecules in a solid are all have a, you know, are all fairly close to each other. It turns out the colder they are, the, the less they are moving, and the warmer they are, the faster they are moving. Their average motion is a little bit higher. They have some energy in between them and in the bonds, and so their average, the more they sort of slam into each other, the greater the average distance between the constituent atoms and molecules is. <clears throat> So at low temperatures, they vibrate with a small amplitude, and at high temperatures, the amplitude increases and gets higher and higher um, until it gets such to the point where they, they sort of lose their connections with each other, and that would be melting um, if the pressure is high enough. <clears throat> and if they continue to do that, get even further and further away from each other on average and get a higher and higher temperature, they begin to just run away from each other into the air um, if they get enough kinetic energy. <clears throat> And cause them to go flying off, and we would call that uh, evaporating, right? Or, um, yeah, boiling, if you like. Um, but before that happens, the whole object will actually expand as the average distance between the molecules gets bigger. Now, this is not something that's easy to predict. Instead, we just use um, uh, an, an approximation. So this is an experimental approximation um, so here's a linear expansion. Let's say you have a bar of metal and you heat that metal up. Its length changes. It gets a delta L, a delta length that is proportional to its original length, proportional to the change in temperature, and proportional to this um, alpha thing. Uh, alpha there is just a coefficient, kind of like the coefficient of friction was something you had to experimentally determine. Alpha is a linear coefficient of the expansion and it term is determined entirely by the material. So copper has an alpha, gold has an alpha, wood has an alpha, well, I don't know, different types of wood probably have different alphas, but you get the gist. So you would have to look that up or experimentally determine it. Then you take the starting length, change the delta T, and then how much for each degree does it move? Um, usually that delta T that alpha will have some reference, whether it's Fahrenheit or Celsius, but almost always it will be Celsius. Okay. Um, so here's something interesting. This is how a, a, a thermostat works because of that linear expansion. So you have two materials. You have steel and brass. They have a slightly different alpha from each other. So as the temperature changes, the length changes differently one from the other, but they're glued together. So that causes, since the brass gets a little bit longer than the steel, it actually bends the entire thing and it curves. And what will happen is when it curves enough, it will create a contact um, and allow some current to run through it. A thermostat and your, you know, your when the current runs through, your heater will actually turn on or turn off, right? So a bimetallic strip um, can be used to measure temperature or do like a physical motion depending on different temperatures. And you just calibrate it to your needs. Different alphas is the only difference there, right? They're in thermal contact with each other, so their temperature is the same, the starting length is the same, but as the temperature changes, the, the change in length is different for each. Entirely because they have different coefficient, coefficients of expansion, different alphas. So this is, um, they always ask a few of these questions, and they're interesting. You have a bad um, instinct with these. So... Here's the deal. As your area increases, as each as each line increases, so does the area increase. And the big thing about the hole in the middle is people think that because they, they sort of divide it into strips, and if the, the length is expanding, then, then the hole must be shrinking. Um, and that's not what happens, because all of the molecules, even the ones that are near the hole are trying to get a little bit further away from each other. The average area, the average distance between them is increasing. Everything expands. Every dimension gets bigger. So the inner hole gets bigger and the outer edge gets bigger. And that's something that um, most people get wrong. Um, so once again, you have uh, this change in area instead of a change in length. And it's exactly the same. I don't know why that became a lowercase t, but 
this T is still temperature. So it's proportional to the change in temperature, to the original area, and now to this gamma thing. But this gamma is just a coefficient of expansion. Again, it's related only to the material. However, you tend not to find it in a book because it's also related to alpha. It's twice alpha because of this, a second dimension. You can just double alpha each little area. If you know anything about calculus, it would be it would make sense as to why that's true. Um, but you don't have to know that. Just know that gamma is two times alpha. In fact, why not just write it to alpha? Uh, I don't know why the book does this. I mean, everybody does it a little differently. So we're going to have a, um, a volume expansion. And uh, I don't know what's going on with this slide. Oh, there it is. <clears throat> Um, so the coefficient of volume expansion, um, same deal, liquids or solids is fine, so your entire, remember all of your dimensions are going to grow, so if it's a sphere with a cavity in the middle, even the cavity would grow and the outer thing would grow, and so you can try to extrapolate and figure out what the radius difference would be or something like that. Um, why they went from alpha to gamma to beta, I do, do not know, um, <laughs> maybe... Uh, volume was much more common or something and so it came first um, but it's the same thing that's the change in temperature the original volume times this beta this coefficient of expansion and now beta is three times alpha because uh